there's a paucity of good quality randomized control trials supporting the vegan diet. When we actually have a look at all the data that's saying vegans are healthier, so on and so forth, they're all observational. A lot of the research comes out of Loma Linda, which is a Seventh-day University um, type uh, environment, where these people, while they, they're not vegan, by the way, the uh, Loma Linda research um, actually allows you to have a little bit of meat and still be considered vegan. Um, it's like when you're a little bit pregnant, I guess. <laughs> and um, so a lot of the research on vegans is going to be, uh, you know, needs that qualification. We also understand this healthy user bias. You know, these people, they're not drinking, they're not smoking, and they're probably leading cleaner lifestyles. The interesting thing is there is a similar population that we can compare vegans to. They're called the Mormons. The difference between them and the Seventh-day Adventists is that they eat meat. And in actual fact, the Mormons also, when we look at this observational data, which again doesn't prove anything, but the observational data shows that they appear to be as in equally good health as the Seventh-day Adventists. So it would seem that the, the meat doesn't really have a role there. But the, in its entirety, the data is simply lacking. There's certainly a decline in performance during the keto adaptation phase. So what most people assume, we, we conflate the rates of beta fatty acid oxidation with keto adaptation. So we, we do these measures and we say, well, you're burning fat at you know, two grams a minute, you know, you're, you're fully keto adapted. And that's not true. The ability to consume the energy resulting from that extra fat that you're burning requires uh, is another phase. So we have ketone transporters, MCT1 transporters, that take a while to upregulate. Speaking to Professor Grant Schofield, um, and he's got some uh, world-class triathletes under his, um, under his mentorship, and he's observed benefits prolonged up for eight, even 18 months after people go on those diets. I generally see that most of the benefits sort of peak out at about three or four months, but it's certainly longer than the two to six weeks that people commonly cite. And we've got very good evidence of that as well. So if we're producing ketones and our, uh, our cellular machinery to utilise those ketones has not been upregulated, then we'll basically wee those extra ketones out. And in doing so, this urinary excretion of ketones actually displaces the excretion of uric acid in the body. So we can actually see, as people adopt a ketogenic diet, that their urate levels will, in their blood will often go up. And that's because the ketones are displacing the excretion of urate. And then usually over a period of about two to three months, we see that the urate then will come back to normal. And that's at the point that I know that somebody is almost certainly fully keto adapted. Oh, absolutely. So there is absolutely a difference in the nutrient quality between grain finished meat and grass finished meat. So that includes DHA. So DHA, about 3% of the fats um, in beef can actually be DHA, which is pretty good. Um, vitamin K2, another nutrient essential for health, absent in plant foods, can be found in grass-finished meat. Vitamin D, so a very interesting story about vitamin D. So the feeding of uh, cattle in, uh, in lots was only really possible in the 1970s when they discovered the ability to inject vitamin D into cattle. Um, so when the process of photosynthesis, uh, cattle will be able to get some vitamin D presumably through the grass and their normal feed like that. But when you replace that with uh, grains, they're not getting that vitamin D. So the ability to have cattle being fed grains long term was only possible once we started injecting them with vitamin D3. So there are distinct nutritional deficiencies. And as I also presented, there's also the possibility that cattle being fed grains and crops are actually going to have a detectable glyphosate residue, which is obviously less optimal. From a general nutritional perspective, though, grain-fed meat is still a far better option for most people, and it's far more nutritionally dense. And you know, if you can only afford grain-fed meat, then there's no reason to avoid it. Um, and I would certainly, as long as you're making sure that you've got some awareness of the nutrients that are not present in the desired quantities in grain-finished meat, like the K2, 
like the DHA, making sure that you're, you know, maybe having some sardines occasionally, maybe making sure that you're having a bit of grass-fed meat occasionally, then you should be fine.